So what's the story with Matt? Yes, I'm completely aware that it's totally cheesy to refer to your ex by a first name. I have no idea who Matt is or was, but this somehow along the way has become my favorite way to split wood. And yes, I know that will be controversial to say, but I can't help it. There are some unique factors that have gone into making Matt the ultimate splitting machine. Why? Well, to start with, this is a very heavy head, and I don't like them all. I said that in the last video that it's just clunky and crude, and this requires a little bit more technique to split with. But let me say, before you get upset, that splitting efficiently starts with the chainsaw. For one, you want to have a round that sits nice and level. So you want to chainsaw them perpendicular to the trunk. If it sits nice and flat, you'll have a better go at splitting it. You also want to cut... How do I say this? You want to make your chainsaw cuts really close to any limbs that are sticking off. That way you can flip the log like this so that the limb part is at the bottom and it gives you more distance to wedge the round apart before it splits and then the grain that's sticking off in some goofy angle will have less of an effect on your split. But there's more. This might be obvious or maybe it's never occurred to you but the taller your round is the more difficult it's going to be to split. It's going to put up more of a fight if it's bigger. So this is something like 10, 10 and a half, and that splits like nice and easy, like butter. I prefer something that's a, between 11 and 12. That's where I find that it's an optimized balance for me to be able to split logs efficiently without running out of energy too quickly. Now, if I'm mauling through 16 inch rounds, I'll probably fatigue faster if we're measuring by the inch in terms of productivity. I think with Matt and with my personal conditioning, I feel that something between 11 and 12 is optimum for me. You can go even smaller and make it easier and then it becomes even more of a cardiovascular exercise. All of this is about balance and opinion and comfort. If you want 16 inch logs because you think that it's faster, then you're going to do less chainsaw work, but you're going to do more splitting work. So, you know, it all depends on your personal situation. Also, my wood burning stove is smaller and the space that I'm going to be heating with it is smaller. So I have no use for 16 inch logs. You make your own determination. Now back to Matt. This was a pretty popular video. I don't know, probably half a million views or quarter million views, I can't remember. What happened here uh, is just some rope and then epoxy. This is a pretty cool video, I recommend watching it. How did it hold up? Amazingly. I mean, I just mashed, <laughs> well, in the video, I actually mashed it intentionally by aiming for the back of the log. Even though nobody believed me, I did it intentionally. I thought that it went without saying that you don't aim at the back of the log because, because if you aim at the back of the log and you actually split the round and you move through it, your handle's going to smash into what remains of it. The most sensible way, and the way that I prefer, is to hit it somewhere like there and split a, oh, what do they call it? A slab. I think they call it slabbing. This is my preferred method. A lot of people don't like to do that because the piece, the slab, you know, this little C-shaped piece will go flying off. Uh, yeah. 
yes, it does, but if you if you pick an appropriately sized piece, it's not going to go flying off so far that it hurts you or breaks anything. It's just a you know if, if you want to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. You can't do this perfectly. You could do it inside of a tire if you want as well, but I don't like to do that all the time because it makes it harder to read the log. Uh, every single one has a unique personality and you look for imperfections and you try to exploit those. It's a game. That's what I'm talking about with respect to elegance. Um, this is a, it's a game where you try to understand it and you try to best exploit its weakness for efficiency. That's what makes it addictive to me as well. I would probably hit this one something like this and then now after it's been weakened then I would hit it something like this or this. Maybe this first, then this, then this and this and then you, it leaves you with something like a square or a pentagon in the middle and you can further divide that later. But it, uh, it, it depends on imperfections that are in this. It depends on the diameter of the log. It, you know, a whole bunch of things that you have to consider. This little cutoff is a, it's an example of a oak round, something like 10 or 11. And that's a pretty easy size to split. And that's also, that also goes into my decision making. If I had larger rounds to split, then I, I might want to use a, um, a maul. But, but the other thing is, if you hit uh, a big log or round like this right in the center with Matt, there's a good chance that it's going to get stuck. Whereas a maul just doesn't like to get stuck at all. But let me tell you why I like this so much. First of all, the mushrooming. Matt has a history of abuse. Somebody was really using him heavily to sledge open some rounds. I don't do that. In fact, um, I think that the abuse has given it a unique geometry. And that's part of the reason that I just seem to love this axe. Since the top of the eye has become smashed down from all the sledge work, it has opened it up in such a way that it never gets stuck. If it does bury itself in that deep, it will have a tendency to pivot. It rotates on that shape rather than having all of this surface area consistently touching all the way through. Uh, so a straight wedge is, in my experience, really easy to get stuck. It's important to keep it smooth for that reason as well. Uh, you might want to keep it smooth. You might be inclined to believe that it's good to just keep it smooth right here, even though mine isn't at the moment, because this is the part, this what they call the bit, this edge, this cutting part is the part that does the initial cutting. So you would think that you want it to have the smallest amount of friction, but you actually want the whole thing to have little friction because as it gets stuck, less friction means it pulls out easier. And there's a considerable amount of energy used on unsticking your axe. And I, d I don't care who you are or how experienced you are, you're going to get your axe stuck periodically if you're splitting rounds with it. This handle broke. Not exactly from abuse, more like a, a combination of mild abuse and bad luck. It wasn't the best handle from the beginning. I love the geometry on this handle. It is a link handle, 32 inch, and it's from Seymour Manufacturing, I, I love it. It's hickory, I love this handle. With respect to its shape, its design, its geometry, it, I love it. But the grain is just completely wrong. The, this company has terrible quality control with respect to the grain orientation.
a real quick explanation. You want the grain orientation to be this way on the axe. It should be running up and down. It should not be off to the side or curvy like this. This one is like at a 45 degree angle, which makes it half wrong. Another giveaway is look how from top to bottom how there's a color change. That's incorrect. You should see a color change from this direction. Here's a better example. I did this one myself. Look how dark it is on this side and how light it is on this side. That's because there's a difference in... I don't know if you can see that. There's a difference in heartwood which is darker on the inside and then this outer wood is lighter. So that's, that gives you an indication that the grain lines are going in this direction. I hope that made sense, if you can understand that. Fading from top to bottom, bad. Fading from side to side, good. This is an extremely heavy axe. The head is something like four and a half pounds. I'll know better once I rehandle it, I'll, I'll weigh it. But my best guess is this is four and a half pounds. And on a 32 inch handle, it just gives you, it, it delivers a considerable amount of force. So this isn't, if you've never handled an ax this big, it's not that far off from a mall. I'll show you how I broke Matt, but I'll demonstrate using this. This is a different axe, but I'll give you the idea of what happened. I was splitting something just like this, something way taller than I normally split. This is, I don't know, probably 17 inches or so, and it's got a maybe three and a half inch diameter. I'm accustomed to using one, a round to split on and then I have another 11, 12, 13 inches up for the log that I'm splitting. When I came down through, for whatever reason, it did split perfectly in half, but as I came through, the half that was ejected out of the back, I don't know how that happened, it happened fast. Usually the two have separate left and right, but for, in this case, for whatever reason, an imperfection or some variable or variation that I can't understand, one of the halves came this way towards me. So as you can imagine, as my swing is finishing, about here, when it's about to hit my chopping block, this hand is here, and this round the, the part that split off came back like this and jammed between my hand and the hatchet handle and the log. So it hit somewhere like that and put a whole bunch of stress right here. And because of the bad grain orientation, the handle just couldn't have, it, it just couldn't handle it. It snapped like that. I, I mean, it was just an instant. No, it didn't even put up a fight. So it's time to give Matt a new handle. I'm trying to do the same thing again, except I wish that I could have one of these link handle division handles, except with a proper grain, but I don't have access to one. I'm just going to keep buying them or looking until I find one, and I'll try to build another axe that's exactly like this. I'm going to be on the lookout for another head that's similar to Matt. No, well, what I'm going to do, well, I, I'm definitely going to repeat this, but I don't think that it was necessary to use such a thick rope because this is above and beyond the amount of protection that's necessary. Although I found that it wasn't very imposing. It, it didn't bother my hand at all. It was quite smooth. And even the parts that started to fray over the course of the last, how long did I split with it? Maybe five months? of using it almost every day or at least every other day. Lots and lots of wood. I mean, just within the last three days of this handle's life, I, I split at least a cord of maple. So there was a lot of miles on this. Can I recommend it? Absolutely. 
I unambiguously, yes, do this. I can't imagine having a better axe guard. But as I've said, probably use a thinner diameter rope than I did. In a nutshell, an axe set up like this with something like a four and a half pound head on a 32 inch handle. It probably works best for rounds that are between six inches and something like 16 inches, assuming that they're less than 16 inches tall. I don't really expect to change any mines. I'm sure a lot of you are still going to say get them all, both with and without irony. But this is how I do it. This is what I'm comfortable with. And I may change, but not right now. Lucky for me, I found a roll of this stuff, which saves me a trip to the store. When you pull on it tight, it's just a little bit more than an eighth of an inch, which is a little bit thinner than what I used last time. So, I'm going to oil this, and then handle it, and then I'll do the epoxy rope wrap, and I'll be back in business. There we go. That's looking better. Don't go away yet. I have one other potentially controversial opinion to express. I'm sure those of you who are still still here won't mind. You probably, if you've been here this long, you probably appreciate the conversational tone where I'm just being genuine with you. Uh, the opinion I want to talk about. The step wedge. I don't want to call it exactly useless, but I don't use them. Here's a case. They're typically put in usually perpendicular to the wedge itself and, and I think the theory behind them is that if you use one then you have an application of a wedge force in both along both axes in both directions against the side of the axe and the front and back. I, I don't I don't see them as necessary for the most part. This was hung in May of 2015, it, it, as I put the date on there, it endured unimaginable stresses and abuses, and there was never a step wedge put in. In order to get this out, I drilled the wedge out. I used wood glue when I put it in. Uh, also, where these cheeks were flared out, you can see the difference because of the sledging on here, the abuse. It caused the cheeks to pound out a little bit. I apparently put some additional wedges in to fill up that space. So I think the trick to, to hanging one of these correctly is to make sure there's no air space anywhere. Um, and to make sure that the wood that you use is dry and intact and driven in tight and used and used with wood glue. The step wedge, I, I just see it as a vector for rust and then they dislodge. Every single one I've ever seen tends to be wiggly over time. Uh, what I mean by vector for rust, when, when, if you get moisture inside, I mean this is wood, it will wick moisture in. And when the moisture gets in, it's often slow to get out and then it oxidizes the metal. Well, you can beat that by using an aluminum one, but aluminum softer. I just don't see it as necessary. As evinced by this case, the handle ends up breaking or I'll just replace it long before it becomes an issue. Some time has gone by. It's about done. This is Matt 2.0. Well, it's probably Matt 12.0. Uh, this, this has probably been around for a while. If you're wondering about the finish, since the handles are the same thing, this finish is a combination of many, many coats of teak oil and linseed oil. I don't really care. I use them interchangeably for tool handles. Teak oil has a little bit of a nicer color, a little bit of a nicer smell. They have slight differences in their cleanup too. But how you get that nice dark grain is just by using dirty hands, using 
dirty oily hands, dirty oily rag. Um, also the epoxy seems as though it yellows over time, but I think that rope was pretty old and dirty, whereas this one was new. But in either case, I think it looks cool. I'm pleased with the smaller uh, rope, has it, 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 it has a overall thinner profile and I like that. So I think this is definitely an improvement. I hope the handle doesn't break, but we'll see how it goes. And it's about time, because I haven't split in a while. So I think that's about it. Oh, one last thing I want to mention. I gave this version proper cheek wedges, and that really drove it in tight. Again, all my wedges were glued, and the fit was airtight, especially down here. When I rammed the axe head onto the handle, it made a, a minor curl all the way around. I didn't stop until the fit was flawless. So I expect that I can get a few years out of it. Well, hopefully. I use it more heavily than I ever did before, so we'll see how it goes. Here's to another several years, Matt. I forgot to date this handle, but hey, I have a video timestamp. It is April 1st, 2019. And let's see how you do this time, Matt. <laughs> Hope you got a kick out of this video. Hope you took something away with you. And I'll see you next time.